Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Ben Keith from Star Sports. Ben, thank you very much for coming on. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Ben Keith from Star Sports. Ben, thank you very much for coming on. That's a pleasure, Jake. I hope that uh, uh, all is well in New Jersey, a place where I'm told that that you're all starting to gamble frenetically. Uh, Possibly you have been for many years, but rather (laughs) than betting with Tony Soprano, you're now betting with with, with bookie chaps like myself. (laughs) That's correct. Things have changed a fair bit here recently, and we'll see what evolves in in other states and and across the US. Uh, And I think this industry here is going to learn from people like yourself and some of the things that you've encountered over the years. So why don't you start by giving us a bit of a, a background and a lot of people will certainly like myself have watched your videos so might have a, a bit of an insight but for those that haven't. When I was 12 years old my dad took me greyhound racing. I didn't want to go. He was going for a work evening. He was supposed to be going with my mum and my mum said go on go with your dad. I said dog racing what do I want to go and watch that for? I've got no interest in that and she said go on off you go with your dad and um I went, my first bet was a £2 place bet on a dog called Sarah Jones. It won, and my story started there. We were sitting in the restaurant looking over the betting ring, and I was fascinated by seeing the greyhounds run, the sand spitting up, uh, the, 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 the action in the, the betting ring, the cut and thrust of it. And from then on, I, I, I feel very lucky personally and professionally because I had direction then as that I knew exactly where I wanted to go. And I became school bookie. I did lots of work experience. Uh, and I started my first job at 17 years of age working for a company then by the name of City Index who did sports spread betting a week after I finished school and they told me uh, two years before that I could have a job when I started so I dismally failed my A-levels knowing what I I was going on to and uh, my career went from there and to be honest with you uh, you do your podcasts Star Sports, we do videos um, uh, to a similar title called Betting People, and it's really about the game, and I think that the game now is so vast. I believe that 20 years ago, it was much more regimented, and if you were a bookmaker, you were a bookmaker, a bit like if you were a lawyer, you were a lawyer, but if you work in betting now, it could you could be bingo betting shops, online, telephone betting, hospitality, apps. IT development, content, whatever it is, I think that there's so much for so many different people. And this is why I, I, I really believe it is such a fascinating industry. Wow, that's a, that's a lot. So when you were younger, did you want to continue to place bets against the bookmaker or were you more than happy taking the bets and, and analyzing your customers even at school level to, uh, to try and take the house edge on your side? I, I, I've always done both. Um, but uh, when I was at school, I learned an early lesson as a bookmaker. I had a box where I used to put my bets in at break time, and the, 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 the other boys and the teachers used to bet with me, and I learned at an early age that uh, punters found ways of getting into that box, copying my writing and putting winning bets in. And um, I would say that uh, it's... Uh, I think that gambling does not bring out the best in people. I think that you see the other side of people when they're gambling. And um, I think that as a bookmaker, as a person, I think advice that I would always give is to be absolutely trustworthy with everybody, to retain your integrity so people are happy to do business with you, but to trust nobody. Because I think that when you are the bookmaker, you are the house. You hold the money, and I think that people will say or do whatever it takes to get in to the bank. 
and um, I think it's a uh, it's a ruthless business, and you have to be ready for all customers coming from any angle. Tell me about City Index and your time spent there, and some of the things you learn along the way. Well, I did work experience there as a teenager, and I, um, you know, that in those days there was obviously no betting exchange, there was no odds checker. People used to make the prices themselves; they would then convert them mathematically into spread betting prices. So it was all done with a pet, you know, pad of paper and a pen and a calculator. And it was um, it was a really fascinating place to work. You'd answer the phone to every client. There was no online, so you dealt with the clients head on. And I think that um, uh, what uh, there, there was a bookmaker called Alan Kinghorn, and Alan Kinghorn ran the Playboy Club in London for Playboy, which was a casino. When that club then closed, he then set up Kinghorns, which was a rails bookmaker offering a private service to big clients. And he taught me, I would have been about 20, I'd started my own business. He said to me, Ben, um, many different people will bet with you and they will bet with you for many different reasons except price. And I think that when you work in the industry, all we think about is how can we get value? How can we take 11 to 10 about an evens chance and find our edge or lay 10 to 11 about an evens chance and have an edge that way? I believe that though still the vast majority of people who bet for their hobby um, bet often with a bookmaker that they relate to. I think that in England there are many different bookmakers and people support them almost like they support football clubs. I think that you know young people are very much attracted to bet with Bet365. I think you know in the north of England, Bet Fred still have a, 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 a huge presence. Paddy Power, you know, they're obviously an Irish company. And for me, I offer a different service, which is more bespoke, where people will go and bet with those enormous organizations, right? And that's possibly like getting a flight with EasyJet or Ryanair. But then they come to me for, for the British Airways experience. And I learned that at City Index, where you deal with the clients. And, you know, it's the difference between a supermarket and a, de- and a delicatessen. And I'm, under, I'm a firm believer in customer service and trying to give each customer the service that they require how true has it held that premise that everyone will bet for many different reasons except price have you found that to be generally true and maybe there's a percentage at the pointy end of this industry that price is all they care about but for the vast majority of people is that something that that stands well with you i think that as a bookmaker if you go out and try and compete on price you'll find that when everybody is evens about something and you make it bigger and you go 11 to 10, when you're right, nine times in a row, the market will move with you to 11 to 10 and you won't take any extra money on it. When you're wrong the 10th time, you'll get your head chopped off and the price will move into four to five. I think that um, if you court clients with prices, I think that and offers and best odds guaranteed and, and bonuses and all the rest of it, I think it will be very, very hard to make a profit. I think that as a bookmaker, unless you have an enormous marketing budget, you cannot be all things to all men. Um, you know, it's a bit like, look, my hobby is I do food vlogs. So I go to a new restaurant, I'll do a vlog on it, right? They get thousands of views, and when I work at the races, so when I'm uh, when I'm being an on-course bookmaker, people will come up to me and they'll say, "Hi Ben, I saw your food vlog, and I, I went to this Chinese restaurant or that." Or they'll say, "Look, we're at Cheltenham. Where should we go for a curry this evening?" I'll tell them, and they'll go, "Thanks for that fifty pound number one." Right now, those people who've connected with me because of that, right? And because I've shaken their hand, I've said, thank you, I've made a joke with them, I've had a chat with them, they are going to be much better clients for me long-term than people who only bet with me when I'm 11 to 10 and everyone else is evens. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. It's it's brilliant in some ways. So I want to ask, when, when did you start to feel comfortable in this industry or have you ever started to feel comfortable or are you always on, on the edge of your seat and on your toes? Well, I think you've always got to be on your toes. I think um, uh, a good friend of mine says that the observer always sees more. And look, uh, 
I've had, as all of us in this industry, maybe it's in our, in our genetic makeup, it's why we're attracted to it, but I've had lots of ups and downs. Bookie, you know, it takes two to make a bet. When the punters win, I lose. When, when the punters lose, I win. And my mum always says, when I'm having a bad trot, she says, don't worry, Ben, you have two good years, two bad years, keep going. This is your life. I think that... Um, when you become a bookmaker or if you're a professional gambler, you're always working. Um, I think that one thing I would say that that has caused is that it is that in my off time, I'm not really off. I'm always preoccupied and I find it hard to enjoy the moment. And my partner, Belinda, will say, she'll say, you're never at home. You're always out. You're at the racing. You're out for dinner. You're in a casino. You're doing this. You're doing that. I'll say, no, that's not true. I'm home more. She says, you're at home, but you're with your phone or you're in your mind, right? Because I think that the game is relentless. There is no first race. There is no last race. There'll always be a client who's winning or there's a problem with a client who's making an argument or, 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 or whatever. And I think that um, if things do run in a cycle and you have a good six months and a bad six months or a good year and a bad year or a good two years and a bad two years, it's probably in that moment when you do drop your guard and you're not on your toes that the market catches up with you and then that's when your bad run starts. I think that all of us know so little. The game is so vast now. There is so much to know. You know, there are so many mathematicians who, you know, they come into the betting world instead of working in the city now. They're discovering new edges. At all times, the market is getting cleverer. And, you know, like a synchronized swimmer, you need to sw swim with that market and just be that yard ahead of it to graft out your edge. Where is your edge? You know, your edge might be in tech. Technology. Your edge might be mathematically. Your edge might be in customer service or having a better opinion than the market, which is a rare, rare thing. I haven't met many bookmakers who bet to an opinion who've lasted, but some do or they claim to. Um, but uh, it, it is a way of life. And I think that um, I don't think that there's a middle ground. I think that you're all in or you're out. Do you think that's one of your biggest advantages and strengths, that relentless attitude to your craft and to the industry? I think that we all become who we are. And I think that uh, one thing I've always tried to do is learn from mistakes. And I think that when you have the fear that you can lose heavily or somebody can be conning you somehow or whatever, once that's with you, it doesn't leave. And it's not some, I don't wake up in the morning and think, right, I've got to be on my game. I just wake up and I am a bookmaker. When I go to sleep, I'm a bookmaker. It's, it, it, it's a way of life and um, it is utterly relentless, yes. But what, what I've tried to do with my group of companies is I've got betting shops, you know, I've got pro punting, I've got online, I've got phone, I've got on course. We now have a recruitment company. We have spread betting. I believe, I may be wrong, but my group of companies spreads across and offers more than any other bookmaking company in the industry. So when I'm out and about and I'm networking, I'll walk into a room and, you know, uh, it might be somebody who can help me or I can help them in any one of those companies. So virtually anybody I meet, I can do some business with them somewhere. So that's very unique and maybe it's a, an aspect of 2019, but take us through the evolution of the business from you know the, the work experience at City Index all the way through now. What stands out throughout all the recessions, through the glory days, all the different cycles of the business? What, what are some of the areas that stand out when you look back over it all? Somebody told me recently that a loss is twice as painful as the pleasure from a gain. And I think that when I look back and I look at T-junctions, I think that those are when I've had very, very bad times. But 
as I said, when I was at school from the first time I went grey, look, really, essentially, my T-junction was the first time I went greyhound racing because everything else was left aside then. And I went all in to be a bookmaker and a punter. There was nothing else. So either I was going to do that or I was going to be stacking shelves in Tesco, right, because there was nothing else. It, it became relentless. It became unrelenting. And um, I think that all I would say is to people that, um, look, uh, recently I heard Jordan Peterson. He's a very, very interesting guy. He's a Canadian, he's like a sort of Canadian psychologist, politician, uh, public speaker, whatever you want to call him, right? And he said that all day long he has people uh, come and see him uh, in his uh, psych psychiatrist position right and they have depression or they have anxiety or they're getting over a terrible incident or they have something that is troubling them and he said that he essentially tells them all the thing all the same thing and that is to get up and to keep going it won't always work but lying in bed has never worked for anybody and i think that um always live to fight another day learn from those mistakes if you don't learn from mistakes and you keep repeating things i think you know the definition and the definition of insanity is to keep repeating something and expect a different result right is that if you're experiencing pain how do you put a guard up and avoid that next time um but really the number one rule is to keep learning and to keep going how have the clients evolved over the years has much changed from the customer side or is it still you know, the punters want to bet and the bookmakers want to take the bet. As I said, everybody finds their area and their place in the industry, whatever that may be. My place is that I offer a, a, a personal service to a purist punter, right? So I go back to the analogy of it's the difference between using Ryanair or EasyJet or flying business class with British Airways. And I would say that, you know, uh, I, what I've built up over the years is a regular clientele of people who come to me. I'm not the best price. I'm not the worst price. I'm the middle price. And they get their bet and they get a good surface and they keep betting with me and I'm grateful to them for their custom. How have you managed to evolve with the industry? So, you know, obviously people would talk about their days on track or on course and, and betting with the everyday punters walking through the gates to the racetrack to now where things are very IT focused, online focused, very much marketing focused. How have you managed to stay up to speed with everything that's happening? It sounds like you've built different areas of your own business among not only bookmaking but, but other aspects. Um, I don't believe in competitors. I'm not looking to stitch any other bookies up. When I meet bookies, I shake their hand. I'm helpful to them. They might hedge with me. We lay a lot of hedging business to other bookmakers. I, I, you know, the gambling cake is enormous, and there's plenty of slice for, for whoever's out there if the service they're offering is up to standard. Um, I think that, you know, uh, I run my own race, uh, as I said, I'm not competing with anybody else, and I keep evolving in that I just keep punching, I keep trying to get new clients, I accept that, you know, not everybody's going to bet with you forever, you're not going to get on with every client, not every client's going to like your service, but keep going and working on what you do, and you will find that place, and by keeping going and, and staying that half a yard ahead of the market, that's how you evolve. Do you have the luxury of being able to sit back and, and think ahead, maybe three, five, ten years down the line and, and plan for where you think things might be going? Or are you pretty much in the day to day and, and don't want to get too far ahead of things? Look, I concentrate on what I'm doing each day, but the business, I've been a bookmaker for coming up for 20 years now, so the business obviously has an established management team, and, and uh, I'm not saying it runs itself, but, you know, it, it, the business each day runs. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm on the phone to the office and different sides of the business the whole time. To be honest with you, I am in the game of risk. Right. I'm approaching 40. I'm approaching the time when I've been a bookmaker for 20 years. I went it on my own at 20. I won 10 grand on a horse. The next day I went into work. I said, I'm off now. Uh, and, that, and I went off with that 10 grand in my satchel. And, and that was my starting ammunition. Um, but 
now with my profits, I put them into property and that's, the property is giving me yield through the rents and each year I hope that will be better. I believe that not many bookmakers retire gracefully. They become lax, they, 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 you know, they drop off their toes, um, uh, they think they know the game, they think the game works for them, they don't work for the game, and then the market, a wave comes over them, like evolution. I don't want that to happen to me. I think that, essentially, when you look at big bookmakers who've become wealthy over the years, it's what they've done with their money from betting. It's not the money they've made from betting because I think that, look, let's look at the top poker players. Let's look at who were the top poker players 10 or 15 years ago. They have a shelf life. The next generation comes along. You know, part of my paranoia is I go to bed at night and I think, well, hey, will another bookie or, or you know, whoever come along and the wave comes over me? Well, when that comes uh, and it's my time to go out to pasture, I hope that I'll be living on my property and I can watch on and, and see the game moving forward. And, uh, you know, I've had a wonderful part of it. And and, uh, I'm very grateful to the game. Tell me about your thought process when building your team. What things do you value in you know, your management, your personnel, people that are going to be working for you? Are there things that you look at and try and identify and then bring in to help you r- grow and run your business? Uh, I think that in business and particularly um, the betting business, I think that you have to be ready to do business with every type of person. You don't have to have Sunday lunch with them and they're not all going to be pleasant, right? And most of them will show you their teeth because they want your money, right? But I only like to work with nice people. I think that um, I've worked with people who are very clever, but who are not very pleasant, and they might have been very clever, but they've ended up doing untrustworthy things to me. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'd rather have a, a daft and loyal donkey, right? But I like to have people working with me and working around me who I believe wish me well. I want them to do well. I want to enable them, offer them as many opportunities to move forward themselves where we can make money together in projects. Um, I think, yes, as I say, I believe that you've got to be ready to do business with anybody but work with nice people. Where do you think you've gathered the most wisdom from? Do you think it's from putting up a stand at the racetrack and, and being there for the eight hours? Do you think it's from building new businesses and and watching them succeed or letting them fail? Is it, you know, reading and researching and digging into some of the literature? What are the areas that have worked for you over the years? Learning from pain. I think that um, the gambling business and those who, I think that the greatest test is time. I think that uh, we, 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 live, we, we live and work in an industry that, that sort of shuns and tuts and, and mocks youth. And we say, hey, well, well, we'll see if you last, kid, and all that. That's what everyone who's sort of 23, 24, they come into the game, hey, you think you know it all, right? And the test is time. And I think that uh, in time, the test is learning from pain. And it's those times when, you know, you've been losing and losing and losing and you you know you've you've chosen not to act quick enough and the tears come and you think why did I do it to myself because essentially you know I chose to make to take or place those bets I chose to kept doing to keep doing that why didn't I stop earlier why didn't I learn earlier and it's about wiping those tears away and saying I'm strong enough to learn from that go out again tomorrow and go out into battle again. I think that um, if you can't take pain and you're not mentally strong enough to keep going, you'll find it very difficult to become a successful bookmaker or professional gambler. I'm curious to whether you think the industry has changed too much or the underlying aspect of it. Obviously, there's features, there's products, there's evolutions and, and new apps and all these types of things, but the core to the business about offering a bet and, and, and placing a bet and receiving a bet for the bookmaker, ha- has that changed much over the decades? I think that it's changed enormously. I mean, I think that um, betting is something that has become much more normalized, right, and something that 
that that everyday people do it was it, it's a bit like you know 15 years ago when somebody was a gambler it was a bit like we was almost the black sheep in the family do you know what i mean now everybody's football team is sponsored by a bookmaker you know uh, everybody's got an app on their phone to have a bet even if it's just on the grand national once a year um it, you know, we don't just bet on horses now. We, we, we People are betting on who's going to be the next Conservative Party leader. Uh, you know, it, who's going to be Christmas number one? Who's going to win uh, Britain's Got Talent? Uh, almost everything that happens in society is now referred back to odds. Um, look, I think it's a harder industry for the one-man band to enter now, but... I still believe that there is a business for the one-man band, and I believe that my much larger fellow bookmakers, the Paddy Powers, the Ladbrokes, the Corals, they almost advertise my service because as i say when you've been herded onto the ryanair plane in an uncomfortable manner half a half a dozen times you sometimes say look it might cost a bit more and, and it might all not be quite as um you know super duper on a tech level as 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 the big guys but i'd rather have that star sports service so what do you tell an 18 year old kid that walks in your office and asks ben what do i need to do to succeed in this industry or what can i do right now to position myself well fake it till you make it i think that uh, essentially even you know i know so little right and i think that when you go out every single person you speak to the best operators across the industry they're learning all the time the game is always moving forward the market is moving forward you know what you know but never think you know it all listen to everybody everybody can teach you something but i would say that yes you pointed out a minute ago, Jake, that the ways that we bet and in the industry has changed dramatically over the last couple of decades. But six to four was 40 percent 100 years ago. When we're all dead, six to four will still be 40 percent. So I think the first thing to learn is the foundations of the maths of betting. Essentially, when I'm standing on a pitch, when I'm calling the office, if I've got 115% on the board and I keep going, I believe eventually I will come out on top. That is my margin. And it's about understanding that margin and protecting that margin. I think, you know, look, uh, anybody can be a busy bookmaker. But one of the, th you know, an old cliche the bookmakers say in the betting ring is it's not how much you take, it's how you take it. You, you know, it takes two to make a bet. The punter's got to make the bet, but you've got to choose to take the bet. So understand the odds, understand the product that you are dealing in. So tell me a little bit about the companions in your industry, those that you've met and worked alongside over the years. Have any stood out and any qualities and characteristics of some of the better ones over time that have allowed them to remain in the industry and obviously yourself uh, spending a lot of time as well? We spoke a little bit about that before, but what have you observed from others in this space? Charles Darwin uh, said, uh, he said, it is not the, uh, the, 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 the strongest or the most intelligent that survive. It is those that adapt best to change. And I think that when I think about the best bookmakers and the best professional gamblers, if they did what they do now, how they did it five years ago, they probably would not be in business. But they've managed to maintain their, shall we say, four or five percent edge because each year. The market's moved half a percent cleverer towards them, but they've moved half a percent cleverer ahead of the market. They've made their statistics better. They've made their apps better, their websites better, their odds that bit more accurate. They've kept moving forward. You know, it's we, we spoke about the relentless approach earlier, that they have not got off that treadmill. They've kept running a half a yard quicker than the treadmill, and they have kept 
adapting. I think that it's the people who suffer who say, uh, well, I mean, 20 years ago, we used to do it like this. We used to do it like this at White City Dogs. Or, well, I mean, you know, when we used to be in the credit office and it was all phone only, we dealt with customers like this. Or we didn't worry about what price it was on a betting exchange. Or, you know, who cares what the Vegas line is? Who cares what Asian ha- what the what's happening in Asia on the football? You've got to care what's happening all over the world and you've got to care what the market's telling you. You work for the market, the market does not work for you. And I think that nobody is bigger than the market. We all work around it. At moments in time, you as a punter might see that the market is a little bit out of line and you can scrape a bit of value and it moves back into line. Then it moves a bit the other way and as a a bookmaker, I take my scrape. But the market is the boss and nobody is bigger than the market. Ben, what's the focus for you and your team in the short and medium term? What can you you share with the listeners about this year or next year or some of the things that are prominent and important in some of your thinking and, and implementation? Star Sports is, is, is an established long-term business. I've been a bookie for 20 years. It, it, it's not, nothing is changing dramatically. Every day we're moving forward. We're working on social media or we're at the races trying to sign up clients or we're doing interviews for betting people that, pe- that thousands of people watch and they hopefully then open a betting account with us. We just keep moving forward. Some days are good, some days are bad, but we go into battle again the next day. I don't think there's a, a Hall of Fame of bookmakers or a, a, a museum somewhere for bookmakers necessarily, but if there was and you were receiving your Lifetime Achievement Award, is there a memory that stands out that you would share with that type of audience or an experience or something throughout the years that, that is, uh, you remember particularly fondly, for example? That's a really wonderful question, Jake. That's a really, really, um, that, 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 that's a question of great depth. Uh, look, uh, I've had a lot of sad times. I've had a lot of, a lot of ups and downs. Um, but I think that what stands out most of all is the camaraderie. I think that, you know, in the betting world, we have our own vocabulary, don't we? We could, we could be at a, at a barbecue somewhere, and I think that betting people will always find betting people, and they'll end up chatting in the corner about, oh, you can't believe it, I backed this football team, they were 2-0 up, then there were two penalties in the 91st and 93rd minute. Um, but I think that, you know, there's those times at Cheltenham where, you know, it, it's, it's the Thursday, we've lost on the Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday, it's Thursday, and, and I've looked at the clerk, you know, Lofty, I, I, I met Lofty when I was 12 or 13 years old, Lofty taught me a lot, uh, and uh, I always said to him when I was a teenager, one day I'm going to be a bookie Lofty, and you're going to be my clerk, and, and I made that happen, and um, I remember uh, two, two, two evenings, my first night at Walthamstow Dogs, that was a life ambition, to be a bookie there, and then also to be a bookmaker in the front row, at Cheltenham and I stood next to Lofty and I looked across at him and I said Lofty I told you we'd get here and he said yes yes you did yes you did and it's those Thursdays where you've lost on the Tuesday and Wednesday and you look across at the clerk you're about to start betting on the first race and you say right let's get the bit between our teeth let's attack again today let's get into those punters and you go forward without fear you you know you get stuck in you take those horses on and and, and it's that camaraderie and working together to, to, to take money, beat the punters. And then on the Friday, it's Gold Cup Day. You hit the front with a good result on, on the Gold Cup and you've had a winning Cheltenham. Yes, so, so I would say it's the camaraderie in the betting ring that would stay with me above anything. But that's a beautiful question. And um, I think that, uh, that, that I'd love to hear a compilation of answers of people that you've asked that to. Yeah, I, to be fair, I probably could have given you a little bit of advance notice. I'm sure when you do get your uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, they'll give you a few days to think about what you might say. But it, there is a lot of depth to some to some of those those thoughts. And I think those you know little things in, in life, in gambling, in, in bookmaking, uh, in sport, 
they're the things that carry you forward. So it's it's I, I really appreciate your your response to that question. But can I can I say something earlier? You sort of said what were the T T junctions? What were the vital moments? I don't think that's what betting is about or should be. I think that you've always got to live to fight another day. Now, look, we all play too big. We all play a bit bigger than, and sometimes a lot bigger than our bank should allow us to cause, because we feel that bit of confidence. But really, I think that it's not about, I remember this day or that day. It's just a, about, I kept going, I kept learning, I kept respect, respecting the market, I kept my integrity, I did the right thing by other people, and people kept doing business with me. And um, I'd also say to you that I'm very, very grateful to um, so many people who stood by me and been great friends, and I'd like to think I've been great friends to other people as well. And I think that there are many ruthless people in the betting industry, but there are also many kind people who will enable others and give others a chance. And now, you know, I'm approaching 40, and um, uh, I would say that, look, I've always had to protect the bottom line. Uh, I've always had to protect the margin, but I've very much enjoyed enabling young people and moving them forward and giving them, it, giving them the encouragement to say, go on, kid, have a go, get stuck in. Absolutely, yeah, and I think that's what hopefully continues on for many more decades to come, and this industry will be powered by the, the kinds of people like yourself. And you're that part are... of that, Jake. What you're doing, spread, you know, spreading the word, speaking to people, listening to different uh, you know, ways that, that we can all be educated and we can all learn. You've found your place there, right, that people tell you their story and others can listen and learn from it. I mean, I always remember when I went... For my first day's work experience, I went to Hove Dogs. I would have been about 13 years old, and I was work, went to work for a man who's still a good friend now. His name's Bo Brown. And I worked with him and his brother, Matt, who very sadly passed away at a young age. And just I was very excited, and just before I rushed out the kitchen door, my dad stopped me. He said, over the coming years, you're going to work for so many different bookies, good and bad. Take the good things, leave the bad and keep learning all the way. And, um, you know, I'm still friends with Bo now, and both of his sons work in the bookmaking industry, and I'm delighted that I've been able to help them find jobs and give them experience. And I think that it all just goes on. And um, I think that we've all got a story to tell, and, and it's great that you're helping people tell their stories. No, I appreciate that, and I certainly appreciate the videos you do as well. I think that's the the small part certainly I can give and, and you certainly give is to just put some information, ideas, some thoughts out there from different people and it's not always perfect. Not everyone wants to hear from from different aspects, but I think at least if nothing else, there's different nuggets or, or at least an entire hour of someone's time is, is very valuable for a lot of people. So hopefully both continue to do that. I wish we had you know four or five hours to sit down together and, and do this over a whole day and release a whole series but maybe we might do that one day because it's it's certainly been fun chatting with you thank you very much and i wish you all the best